Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for the new edition of Telil 24-7, the first for the new year, 2022. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and we have a jam-packed show for you this week. Later on, you'll hear about whether the debate over whether Richmond should be governed by a mayor or a warden will be revived as the county takes a look at its municipal boundary system. We'll also hear how one Richmond County Councillor is not done trying to make sure that properties around the county are adequately taxed and that those taxes are indeed collected by the municipality. You'll also hear a recent presentation to Richmond Municipal Council by committee members of the fundraising wing for the Cape Breton Regional Hospital's Cancer Care Centre. But we begin with the issue of unsightly premises cases around the Strait area, and more specifically around the town of Port Hawkesbury. These issues landed at Port Hawkesbury's latest regular monthly council meeting, and not only do they involve residences scattered around different parts of Port Hawkesbury, including some close to the town waterfront, but also a site that you may be very familiar with whether or not you even live in Port Hawkesbury. Let's go there now. This is Reeve Street in Port Hawkesbury, and behind me is the Causeway Shopping Center. This decades-old shopping plaza has been one of the most recognizable parts of Port Hawkesbury for anybody who lives here, drives through here, or even lives about 50 kilometers from here. That's because it has some of the most recognizable franchise names in Atlantic Canada, everything from supermarkets and pharmacies to banks, restaurants, pool halls, and even some smaller businesses that have just opened up in the last couple of years. But then, there's the backside. The deteriorating condition of Port Hawkesbury's most prominent strip mall has been a concern for many months, and Port Hawkesbury Town Councillors and the Eastern District Planning Commission want to see action taken as soon as possible. The most recent discussion about the condition of the Causeway Shopping Center's backside came at the most recent regular council meeting for the town of Port Hawkesbury. The director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, John Bain, made a presentation to this virtual meeting of Port Hawkesbury Council, and Bain's discussion included an update on his conversations with the owners of this strip mall on Reeve Street, Econo Malls, based in the Montreal suburb of Westmount. Back in May of, of this year, we had issued an order for them to, uh, to address some of the cosmetic issues with the back of the building, and, um, and as well as some of the structural uh, items. And uh, that order was just a 15-day order. And, and in response to that, they did get as their engineer report of the um, uh, structural integrity of the back of the building. And they, um, they, um, they did do some cosmetic painting, covering up some of the more offensive uh, graffiti. Uh, so as far as timelines, they, they applied for permits for the uh, work that was identified in their um, engineer's report uh, last year, back in December, those permits have been issued. And our expectation is that the, the, the work will be done forthwith. And then after the work's done in the spring, um, then they'll do a paint uh, as opposed to uh, painting and then patching. According to the Eastern District Planning Commission, the owners of the Causeway Shopping Centre have made regular efforts to paint over graffiti on the backside of their building over the past couple of years. However, graffiti has a habit of reappearing in spots where it's been found in the first place, and as you can see behind me, there's still a lot of work to be done here at the Causeway Shopping Centre. In speaking to the latest regular public meeting of Fort Hawkesbury Town Council, which was held virtually on Thursday, January the 6th, the director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, John Bain, explained that the owners of the Causeway Shopping Centre were reluctant to carry out painting over and over again since it would get in the way of brick and masonry work that's already being carried out and is expected to continue this coming spring. He offered hope that the painting would continue to be able to cover up graffiti like that which you see behind me, but, all evidence to the contrary, some town councillors are not happy about these developments. It's less than appealing. And, you know, I think a fresh coat of paint would, uh, would improve that 100%. A few hours with a, with a spray gun in the back of that building would improve it immensely. We have a council that's very motivated to, to get housing here, to get new business here. And when you drive into any area, your first impression is your lasting impression. And if you drive in an area where a lot of things are looking nice and some are not, you don't remember what's looking good. It sticks in your mind what doesn't look good. 
So a, a little bit of cosmetic work, I think, could go a long way in, in helping promote this town. While he doesn't dispute the concerns raised by the deputy mayor and by Port Hawkesbury residents, particularly those living in the Summit Park subdivision, John Bain suggests that his office has had a good working relationship with Econo Malls, the owners of the Causeway Shopping Centre, and points out that their efforts to clean up the building have been hampered by geography and by the COVID-19 pandemic. There's other opinions of, of the relationship with the, the owners, but I've, I've found them to be genuinely um, sincere in their desire to, to uh, address the issues, uh, dealing with us in good faith and uh, doing the best they can, can. I mean, they are in Montreal. Um, at one point, they're, they're, they had a um, manager that couldn't get here because of the um, travel restrictions and sure. requirements for... Um, self-isolation quarantining when you got here and and they're not the most compliant but at the same time i, th I think a lot of times they do have uh, legitimate reasons for not getting things done as quickly as we would have liked however even with this acknowledgement of the challenges faced by econo malls john bain and the eastern district planning commission agree with deputy mayor jason o'coin and others that the problems facing the causeway shopping center's backside can't be ignored i did take the time to drive behind every commercial building in port hawkesbury and um even the the former kentucky fried chicken building which is an abandoned building in behind the building itself doesn't look too bad the the building the shopping center is definitely one of the if not the worst backs of a building from an aesthetic point of view so there's little expected to be done at the causeway shopping center over the winter deep freeze here in port hawkesbury however both bain and a coin are optimistic that this particular piece of property that's so integral to the look and the economic development of port hawkesbury will see the attention it needs over the coming months now, you may have heard just a couple of moments ago that John Bain, the director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, mentioned the former KFC location at 643 Reeve Street in Port Hawkesbury. The building is highly visible for anybody living or visiting the town, and it's been in deteriorating shape since KFC Canada pulled out of the franchise just about a year ago. However, according to Bain, the Eastern District Planning Commission can't actually do something about this building unless someone files an official complaint. If your audience is um, concerned about a building, we have a form. They could fill it out and they could send it in to us. Uh, apart from that, I, I don't have a policing function. I don't go around looking for them. And um, that is a, that's been a concern of some on council that we don't have a policing function. Um, it's a factor of the cost. Now, now, Amherst does a, a twice a year drive through the town and they go looking for stuff. Um, I can tell you that that is very unpopular with the population. Um, you know, the citizens of, of uh, Amherst feel that they're being um, checked up on by, by municipal employees. And it, it, from a PR point of view, it doesn't go over very well. John Bain is hoping this more cautious approach by the Eastern District Planning Commission washes well with Port Hawkesbury residents, even when it comes to a rash of unsightly premises cases that have come up on Granville Street and Lower Water Street over the past couple of years. At last week's regular council meeting, Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton suggested that the Eastern District Planning Commission should expedite these cases, and she claimed that they could hamper Port Hawkesbury's efforts to develop and promote its waterfront. Here's how Bain and the Eastern District Planning Commission have responded to this concern. The mayor is, um, uh, you know, being proactive with respect to um, promoting the town for investment. That's her responsibility. If I don't receive the complaints, we're not going looking for them. Every file is unique. And if I get a complaint about uh, Granville Street, I will expedite that given the mayor's con concerns. But um, every, every case is unique. And sometimes um, 
I, I want my people to approach dangerous and unsightly premises with a degree of compassion. While he agrees that there are some problem areas along Granville Street and Lower Water Street, describing a couple of them as eyesores, Deputy Mayor Jason O'Coin agrees with Bain that unless members of the public actually report these incidents to the Eastern District Planning Commission, there's not much that the organization can do about them. The general public will come and they will voice their concerns to council or the mayor. and. They expect us to be able to just fix it at the snap of a finger. Well, what the town really needs and what will help us improve these situations are to have residents go into the Eastern District Planning Commission and fill out a complaint so that they can open a file on it. You know, before I got into municipal politics, I thought Eastern District Planning drove around looking for this stuff. That's not the case. That's not their job. So if the residents of Port Hawkesbury were to bring these cases forward to Eastern District Planning, then there's a file open on it, and that will really help town council be able to push the envelope on getting these things uh, rectified and fixed. That being said, you know, there's there's some files that have been outstanding for quite some time down in that in the lower part of town that we brought to light last Thursday. And I expect fully that the Eastern District Planning Commission will, will work quickly and, and have these uh, issues. Resolved. At the same time, O'Coin isn't trying to discourage his Port Hawkesbury constituents from coming forward to him with these issues, but he is reminding them that he's not the final step in the process. If you see something that's unsightly or it's unsafe, by all means, contact one of us. Um, you know, everybody knows my contact information. They know how to get a hold of me. Uh, I'm out in the public a lot. But also take that extra step and, and make the file the, the concern. Nobody knows outside of the office who files the concerns. So you don't have to worry about your neighbor coming back, you know, knocking down your fence or something like that in retaliation. It's, it's anonymous, it's private, but this is how we, we get things done. So I guess one thing to educate people on is if I as a counselor go in and make a complaint to the Eastern District Planning Commission, as John stated in the meeting Thursday night, that counselor cannot discuss that issue. Mm. So once, once I go in and I, I may sign that dotted line, I have to step away because then it's a conflict. So it makes it easier for us if, if the public do it, and then we can all get involved and we can all be part of the solution. So whether it's a matter of a single dwelling, a deteriorating business building, or a major strip mall, the message is the same from both Town Council and the Eastern District Planning Commission. No matter what the size of the issue, you can't get anywhere unless you file a complaint with the Commission. In Port Hawkesbury for Tillil 24-7, I'm Adam Cook. Let's turn our attention to Richmond County now and ask the question, should the county be governed by a warden chosen from within the elected councillors or by a mayor elected at large? The last time Richmond County attempted to answer that question, two years ago, it went quietly without any formal decision. But it's back on the agenda over the next couple of months as Richmond Municipal Councillors take a new look at their municipal boundary system as directed by the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. That discussion got quite a bit of attention at the most recent Richmond County regular meeting held just before Christmas. So we're going to take another look at that discussion right now. But first, here's a little background. In 2014, the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board declared that Richmond Council must send a proposal for the number of districts and councillors for the municipality going forward. At the time, there were 10 council districts, and a majority of councillors, six to be precise, voted in favour of keeping the status quo. However, four other councillors submitted what they described as a minority presentation, insisting that the number of councillors drop to seven or to five from ten. In March of 2015, the Utility and Review Board held what turned out to be a seven-hour hearing on the issue at the New Horizons for Seniors building in Arishat. Two months later, the Utility and Review Board ruled that Richmond must drop its number of municipal districts from 10 down to 5. Later that year, municipal councillors started debating as to whether to apply to the Utility and Review Board to change Richmond's governance system from a warden system to a mayor system. A majority of councillors voted in favour of the mayoral system. However, they soon discovered that they had missed the deadline for applying to the Utility and Review Board for such a decision by one month. And so, in the municipal elections that took place in October 2016, a warden system resulted, with Brian Marchand becoming the new warden as chosen by the councillors that were elected in the new five-seat system. 
In 2019, during Richmond Council's most recent strategic planning exercise, residents who attended strategic planning meetings around the county were given the option to voice their opinions on whether a mayoral system should be pursued. A grand majority of residents that took part in surveys that were part of this strategic planning process voted in favor of going to a mayoral system. The county's deputy warden at the time, Jason McLean, attempted to get this conversation going again in the spring of 2020. However, shortly thereafter, it was quietly decided amongst councillors without a formal vote that the mayoral system option would not be pursued at that time. So that's the history of the process. Now let's join the Richmond Council meeting from December of 2021 and hear from Warden Amanda Mumberkett as to the next steps. The Municipal Government Act does require us uh, to apply to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board in this coming year, 2022, to confirm or to alter the number and boundaries of polling districts and the number of councillors in our municipality. So it's a requirement that we have to do this work. Um, It's something that we have to do every eight years, and that's been going on since 2006. Um, So the idea is that we would study the number number and the boundaries of our polling districts, their fairness and reasonableness, and the number of councillors. When we complete the study and before the end of the year, 2022, we must apply to the board to confirm or to change the number and boundaries of polling districts and the numbers of councillors. So... It doesn't necessarily mean that change is coming. Um, It could be just that we complete the study and then confirm that the status quo works for us. But the bottom line is, is we do have to conduct the study um, into it to to, before we can confirm that. Um, So all municipalities and towns in the province are being advised of this process. There's a user guide that's been provided to us by um, the chief clerk of the the UIRB uh, to help us kind of prepare those applications. We have a couple of options. Um, Council can decide to hire a consultant or a third party to do the required study. But the bottom line is, is we do have to get the study done. Many councils, um, uh, you know, though, choose to direct senior municipal staff to conduct the study. In, in some cases, that's aided by committees, which include members of the public. And um, the board is recommending a two-step process. At the first stage, we would decide the desired number of councillors, how many, how big our council should be, and then we would address questions about the distribution of the polling districts in a second stage. So that's kind of the two steps they're, they're, um, they're recommending. Um, regardless, uh, you know, they've noted that public consultation is also an inherent part of the required study. The type and amount of consultation is within our discretion as a council, but we must give members of the public an opportunity to express their views on the size of council and upon the location of boundaries uh, in municipal polling districts. Um, it's kind of, it's a key part of the decision-making process. So once the application is received, when we've completed the study and we submit the application, the clerk of the board will contact the municipality to schedule a public hearing. And then the board usually issues a written decision within 60 days of the hearing um, and and make a final decision on that. This has to be completed before the end of the year. So it appears as though, you know, there, it may just be an indication that we don't want to change. So the, it would be rather, uh, rather simple at that stage. However, if there was a desire to increase the number of uh, councillors and change the boundaries, uh, then of course, then the consultants would, would likely uh, be involved. And of course, the process would take itself from there. So I, w- I would suggest that we, we, uh, we refer to our budget deliberations and senior staff can perhaps get some information on costs associated with that to prepare for uh, a line item. in in the upcoming budget. One thing I wanted to mention on that as well is I think during our campaign, which is still a little fresh in my mind, we kind of identified some places where there should maybe be some boundary tweaks. Mm -hmm. I feel like like Thibaultville area, deputy warden, like I don't, do you remember discussion around that? And then I think down the Grand Grand Road and maybe one area of Lennox Passage, I can't. Yeah, Lennox Passage being in yeah. District 2 versus 3, uh, you know, or yeah, right. there was a few tweaks. I thought that we actually did up a list at one of our meetings, I, and maybe I just, we had chatted about it and I wrote it down, but I, you know, I think we want to, at minimum, cool. consider that. And I think we want to do some level of public consultation for sure. I, I don't know how detailed, and I don't know how detailed, how, how, how you can get into any detail, but not a lot, you, you know, like it's hard to know where the balancing piece is. And I guess my other question, my that's those are my comments. My question is, um, uh, a couple of people have mentioned to me like this idea of a mayoral system, right? And so I just yes. like, is that would that be part of that type of um, 
it, would this be the juncture where we would consider that, uh, Don? Um, I don't think that that would be part of that process. And okay. because when you when you're uh, when you're in, when you're deciding that you want to go to the mayor system, um, right. you would just make a decision to go to the mayor system. Uh, however, the problem with going to the mayor system is that you can no longer return to the warden system. Ah. Uh. Okay, but once you go, no, once you go, no going back. once you go to it, there's no going back That's if you right. don't like the there's way no, it works. There's no going back to the warden system. Interesting. What that would do is that would, that would maintain yeah. the boundaries, and then you mm -hmm. would have as a mayor at large, so you'd have six oh. council members as opposed to uh, to five. Okay. Or or the districts could be changed to be four councillors and a mayor, right? Like also another option would be or, to rejig yeah. everything again, right? It just could be part of that public consultation, even though it's not technically part of this project. If we budgeted it properly, we could get a consultant to consider those options, right? Like I'm just again, I'm not I'm not in favor or not in favor of a mayoral system. I've not given it a great deal of thought, but where it has been mentioned to me by a few people in my mind, I'm just thinking, well, would we be remiss to not even have that conversation, right? That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it really. I think it's a great idea, Deputy Warden. I know several people have talked to me about it as well. Just mm -hmm. wondering, like, are we going to pick that back up? Some people seem to be very much like for yeah. that type of a system. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked with municipalities with both types of, you know, of, of governance systems. And uh, so it would be interesting to, um, uh, you know, probably wise to get some, to, to include that if we're going out to do public consultation. Yeah, towns are legislated, they need mayors. Yes. However, with respect to rural municipal units, it's a choice. And yes. I think currently right now, there may be three within the province that have uh, mayor systems. Yeah. The rest are all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, would folks at this point be okay with? Um, so, so part of my concern with deferring this to budget, though, Don, is uh, we're going to run out of time in 2022. You know, I, you know, by the time our budget is approved, it's usually Mayish, right? Um, to try to start some public consultation, then is, <laughs> you know, we'd have to wait till September. I would say, because we're not going to get consultation effectively, I think, done over the summer. I doubt it very much. Um, people are going in different directions. But if we were approved in May, we put out an RFP through the summer, we got every all our ducks in a row with the, with the condition that it had to be wrapped up by the end of November. I mean, if you look at the yeah. work that they're doing with the zoning, right, saying their, their timeline's pretty tight to deliver yeah. as well, and they're doing it, you know, so I think yeah. it just that our RFP would just need to be tight, tight on deadlines. But I think if we're, you know, obviously if we're talking about spending money, we have, we don't have a lot of options here. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't, I don't think that you'd have to wait till the budget was approved. If, if in April, when, when council uh, meets in April, if they wanted to have, uh, make a motion to have uh, uh, that process uh, started, then it would, it's possible. Mm. We could do yeah. it. Yeah, and we would have to wait till the budget was was approved. I mean, it'd be important to get it going and get it started, uh, RFP, and get it uh, get it to the point where, um, you know, we get it started by the time the budget is uh, is approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's a great point, Ellen. Thank you. Any other counselors have um, thoughts they wanted to share on this? Okay, so I'm hearing maybe some consensus around deferring this to budget discussions. I don't think we need a motion to that effect, uh, or maybe we do just where it's UARB related. Um, I think just to cover our, our, yeah, just to cover us, we'll uh, make that motion. I'll make a motion. So, yeah, I'll make a motion to refer it to budget deliberations. Thank you, Councillor Sampson. Can I have a seconder on that? Make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Dinja. Uh, any further discussion? Question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those, those opposed? Okay, that motion is carried. The Cancer Care Unit at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital in Sydney is getting an overhaul. It's all part of a reorganization of hospital space and facilities that was announced by the provincial government nearly three years ago. 
Earlier this week, at the Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Municipal Council, the fundraising committee for the new cancer care unit at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital made their pitch to councillors and council staff to get a sense of whether the council might come on board with some funding and to provide some information about how the project is going. So we're going to give you that presentation right now here on Tell Ill 24-7. In just a few moments, you're going to hear from the chair of the fundraising committee, River Bourgeois native Mike McPhee. Yes, that's the same Mike McPhee that won a Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens in 1986. You'll also hear from another familiar voice, Bob McCachern, the former owner-operator of 101.5 The Hawk FM, as well as Dr. Rex Dunn, a veteran surgeon serving the Sydney area, but we begin with the CEO of the Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation, Paula McNeil, who is going to set up the presentation that was given to Richmond Municipal Council just a few days ago. Let's have a look. So we're going to talk tonight about, um, give you a quick overview of the Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation. We're going to talk specifically about cancer care within the eastern zone of Nova Scotia Health. And we're also going to talk about the cancer care here at home campaign, which we're pretty passionate about. In the interest of time, I will quickly tell you about the Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation. It was established back in 1985 by a group of volunteers. They were lobbying so that the, um, the area could have a regional center for health, which eventually became the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. Cape Breton Regional Hospital gets more than um, 600,000 visits in a year. So it's, uh, it's certainly well utilized by the island and the people of the Eastern Zone of Nova Scotia Health. It gives the Regional Hospital Foundation gives about $55 million a year to support the healthcare needs of the, um, of the hospital. Everything from the small to the large, large being equipment, small things, making sure people, for example, from Richmond County have the uh, transportation needs met so that they can attend the uh, Cape Breton Cancer Center that's located here at the regional. And there's about 1.5 million a year that's dispersed to people for those particular needs. The story about uh, Cape Breton and cancer is uh, one that many of you know. Uh, to start with, uh, the cancer center that we currently uh, enjoy and support the community is, uh, was established in 98, opened in 98. And the original idea was for it to service about 15,000 visits per year. Well, that's grown over the last 20 plus years to 45,000 visits. So that's why we're here uh, today uh, in uh, that uh, we've got a new cancer center being established uh, in connection with the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. Uh, unfortunately, Cape Breton has some of the highest rates of cancer in the country. And uh, we feel that... Uh, Connected to that is the rates of, pop, uh, of uh, poverty in the country, in, the, in Cape Breton, in relation to the country, that it's extremely high. But I know that uh, the folks on the, on the line and, and on council would be very familiar with that as well. Um, one thing we note that Cape Bretoners present at a later stages in diagnosis when it comes to cancer. Rex will probably talk a little bit about that uh, uh, later in the, uh, in the presentation. And of course, the other piece that is connected to cancer care and, uh, and uh, people who are seeking um, you know, support around uh, their cancer diagnosis is an aging population. So th all of those things kind of come together to uh, present somewhat of a, a challenge to Cape Breton. And uh, we feel that uh, part of the answer at least is this new a Cape Breton Cancer Care Center that uh, will be open, you know, within uh, a reasonable uh, um, amount of time. Uh, so we're kind of, I guess, our team is is gearing up for that uh, uh, for that eventuality. As Bob has mentioned, um, cancer numbers are quite high in the um, the eastern zone of Nova Scotia Health. So the Cape Breton Cancer Center actually serves. Cape Breton Island, but it also goes as far as Guysboro and Antigonish. And we actually some people see some people from New Glasgow who come to the cancer center. So um, Bob talk, talked about the numbers. So because of these numbers, the new Cape Breton Cancer Center is being built. 
and the Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation has launched a $10 million campaign that will support the, um, the new Cape Breton Cancer Center. So with that, that campaign is called Stronger Together Here at Home, the um, Cancer Care Here at Home campaign. And so Mike is chairing that particular campaign. He's also joined by Rex and Bob who are with us here today. Other members of the cabinet would include honorary chair, who's Chief Terry Paul, who's well known nationally, of course, as the chief of member two First Nations community. George Unsworth, who is an accountant here in oh. Sydney area. He um, had, of course, Unsworth Cachavanis for many years. And uh, Dwight Rutterham, who is a past chair of the board for the Cape, uh, Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation. And Dwight is the, um, he's a lawyer with Breton Law, a lady by the name of Catherine Van Nostrum. So Catherine is, um, her and her husband, Steve, have Celtic Kubota here in Sydney. And then Martha Van Zuften Campbell. So Martha is, of course, part of uh, the Van Zuften family and, and, and known for that. So we have representation on the, uh, on the campaign cabinet from across the island. I think that in your uh, materials there, I hope you have a list of uh, not only the programs, which are very important, uh, one being the complementary therapies, exercise, the patient care fund, which is so important. And uh, another big one is the research and innovation, which uh, is very important because we are the only the second center in, in Nova Scotia that can carry out this work. It's amazing how many studies are going on now and where this could take us. So my role really is to talk about vital equipment. And I can tell you, this is a very exciting time for us. To, uh, never in uh, my lifetime, I fear, have I seen such uh, enthusiasm. And it's all around this tremendous uh, initiative to build uh, what's already underway up there at the original site. I thought it was a big deal when they put in the cancer center about 25 years ago. That we'd never need anything more than that. We had tool in our accelerators. Wow, state of the art. But guess what? And over time, things change. The uh, technology never stops uh, being improved. So you do tend to get behind. So this is an opportunity now for us to try to make sure we can offer everything reasonable here in Cape Breton at the highest standard. So with that in mind, we look at the little list there. And uh, I don't know if you have the same list as me, but just I'll, I'll just read a couple off and I'll do it quickly. There's a variant identify guidance system. This is tacked on to our radiotherapy unit. It's a, it's a cutting edge uh, technology that allows even more precise uh, aiming of the beams and therefore more precise treatment. Uh, and I must say that uh, it's there's not a lot of these around, but if we had one, uh, this would take us right up to the very uh, latest that's available. Uh, the echocardiogram machine that's on my list here is a widely used machine for many things, but also for cancer patients to determine whether they're able to take the treatment or not. A gamma camera we've had for years, but ours has uh, pretty well had the biscuit. It's old, it has to be replaced, and it's essential uh, for staging cancers, amongst other things, but a very important tool for that. And I'm happy to say that the foundation has already made sure that this one in particular is going to happen. Um, an image guided sinus surgery system. That was a new one to me, I must say, but uh, we have a couple of uh, talented young ENT surgeons now in Cape Breton. And this particular piece of equipment is a tiny little CAT scan machine that allows you to see way up inside the sinus. It's a very difficult place to pick up a cancer. They're not common, but if you don't have equipment like this, you certainly couldn't treat it very well and uh, they're keen to have this and, and get on with their work. Radio frequency ablation generator. This is a, a way of treating sometimes primary cancers, but also a number of localized metastatic cancers by putting a hot little wire right in the center and basically uh, uh, frying that tumor uh, without uh, affecting the surrounding tissue. So 
but that's that's part of the equipment. You also need very good imaging equipment. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of other big ones on on the line. We're hoping that we can look at an interventional radiology room. We have them now, but they they need to be upgraded. Time, as I say, goes on. And when you think about trips to Halifax that could be avoided for cancer patients, a particular pet project of mine is thoracic surgery. We used to do that particular can cancer care here, but that ceased a few years ago. And so all of those patients for all of their workup pretty much have to go to Halifax and much of it could be done here. So we're hoping to, to support that. And uh, there are a couple of other uh, items that we will be getting to. It's a long list, really, when you think about it. But those are the kind of things that we have uh, talked to our local experts about, and all of them uh, would be very useful. So th these are the kind of things that we're going to hopefully be able to uh, finance with our, with our campaign. Thanks. On your list, on your wish, wish list of equipment, what about a PET scan? So those right now, I think, are only available in Halifax, yeah, right? Is that something you're... Right on the mark there, and I'll let Paula pipe in there, too. too. We've, that's been our number one goal, and we've offered to pay for one. But uh, we haven't yet got final approval to actually do that. When you raise money for anything for Nova Scotia Health. It uh, stands to reason, of course, that you have to get permissions. They wanna make sure that you know it is equipment that is necessary or that there's not uh, any other costs that are associated with that equipment that would, uh, that would not be reasonable. So everything that we've listed on the list, we've worked with, you know, with Dr. X Dunn, Dr. Elwood McMullen, um, the who's the uh, who would be the head of uh, the head of the redevelopment for the uh, for the cancer center to and, and the executive director Brett McDougall for the zone to get permissions for everything that's on the list and one of the things uh, Melanie that's on our list is a PET CT scanner so the whole point of this campaign is that we don't want people to have to travel five hours. Uh, to get cancer care. It's people are at their most vulnerable point in their life. And it is, uh, we see people, they're either suits too sick to travel, they don't have the wherewithal to be able to navigate in Halifax. And we quite frankly, see people who have limited means and they just can't afford to travel. So we've been lobbying very hard to get a PET CT scanner. We've actually had some really great conversations with Nova Scotia Health, in particular with the new interim CEO, Karen Oldfield. Um, the new premier is, is um, seeming very much like he's on side with the uh, with the PET CT scanner. So we're navigating our way through that now, but lobbying pretty hard because that's something that we want. I think we remain very, very positive that we're going to get final approval. That's really all we can say until we get final approval. But that was a, a good question. It's a question we get uh, quite often. The PET CT scanner is, um, as Rex said, it's right at the top of our list. So uh, we're, um, we're very hopeful that we're going to get approval um, short term here for that uh, very important piece of equipment. To add on to that, it's, it's uh, ironic in a way the previous government had actually approved that, but unfortunately, in the election, so we are very hopeful. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things have happened. We've had an election. We've had Nova Scotia Health to uh, completely revamp themselves. From a cancer point of view, as Bob was saying, the numbers you know, are worse for, um, worse for Cape Breton than the rest of the country and mo most of the provinces anyways, and we all have a story on uh, stories about cancer and how it's affected our family and friends and, and uh, some good stories as well. My father and my, my wife's father both are cancer survivors. Uh, however, you know, we lost, um, I lost a brother-in-law 56 years old of cancer about a year and a half ago and, and it, it goes on and on. So, so we, I think we know in K, as K Bretoners the need for this cancer care center. One of the things that um, uh, one of our focuses besides obviously having better care for Cape Bretoners and, and saving lives and, you know, the, the ultimate goal. One of our uh, number one objectives is to have more care at home. And that's uh, it, uh, our campaign name is Cancer Care Here here at Home. So we're trying to make it so, as Paula said, it's, it's hard to travel to, uh, 
to Halifax for treatment. Some people don't have the wherewithal to travel. Uh, and you don't have the support of your family and friends if you do that. And at a time like this, when your world's turned upside down, that's that's very important. So, so care at home is uh, uh, with all these these three areas that Rex talked about. That's uh, probably our number one objective to get more of that high quality care at home. The one thing we know about K Bretoners is that they help each other, and uh, you know. There's, we see that all the time. We see it. I, I always uh, reference Christmas Eddies when we're looking at how how K. Bretner's support versus you know other other provinces in mainland Nova Scotia. So we definitely uh, punch above our weight, and we we know that K. Bretner's are going to get uh, get behind this. Um, um, Paula talked about our team. We also have uh, you know besides our cabinet, we have advisors on the side that are helping. Uh, names like Annette Bershear and Joe Shannon, Stuart McLeod, names you would all recognize. They're there for us and have, have been helping us uh, uh, in any way they, they can. As far as campaign, we launched in November. We started back in, uh, we, we cabinet uh, came together in last January, but we've been going through a lot of what we just talked about with the um, getting our wish list together. We have had a great start. We're at uh, around 5.5 million of 10 million. So it's been a really good start for the last couple of months. But the last half is always the toughest. Uh, for Richmond County uh, obviously uses the Cancer Care Center, and that's why we're here today to try and get your support. There are Our numbers show that in uh, the last full fiscal year, there were 161 unique patients uh, to the Cancer Care Sid, uh, Center in Sydney. Uh, so each of those patients obviously would uh, would travel to Sydney for treatments and and uh, and, and monitoring more than one time. Of our numbers show probably an average of 14 times. So over 2,000 visits by people in Richmond County uh, in uh, fiscal year 2021. Um, Richmond County has been um, a, a good giver of the foundation uh, in the past. Um, this being our largest um, campaign ever at, at 10 million, uh, we really would like to have your support. We're, we we don't like to throw numbers out, but we're often we're often asked, and, and the uh, for maybe for your information, what we're looking we're looking um, uh, we're hoping, I guess, for something in the range of 100,000. That's what we would. Uh, we would hope Richmond County would be able to um, to help us with the campaign. I'm a little struck by that number. So 161 patients from Richmond County in fiscal 21. Is that what is that what I heard? That's, yeah, 161. Correct. That's an incredible number. So it's a huge amount of people from our tiny little county. So um, yeah, so I'll be adjusting that number for a little while. But thank you for sharing it. Um, and I, I think you're right, Mike, um, you know, um, I don't think there's any one of us here that hasn't either been personally touched or our family or our friends by cancer and had the support of the, uh, of the, of the cancer center in, in Sydney uh, through that. So thanks for the work that you're doing on this. I can tell you, you know, obviously with an investment of that size, that is something that we would defer to our budget deliberations typically. Um, so, you know, we can, we can go ahead and do that, um, and potentially looking at, um, you know, our, a multi-year commitment. Is that, is that an option that's on the table? I'm seeing Paula nodding her head there with that. Okay. A lot of uh, donors are, are doing it over a five-year period. You know, you can reach out to us if you have any questions in the, uh, in the, in, that come up uh, either to probably through, through the foundation, Paula, I guess, or you know, if you want directly to me. Regular viewers of Tillil 24-7 might remember that District 2 Richmond County Councillor Michael Digden has been carrying on a campaign for several months now to determine whether people who own property around Richmond County are being adequately taxed. Last spring, Councillor Digden brought up the issue, claiming that there had been properties going back nearly half a century that weren't being properly taxed, resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue to the county over the past 50 years. The Property Valuation Services Corporation, or PVSC, conducted an investigation of the situation, and later in the fall, they reported to Richmond Municipal Council that they hadn't seen any signs of widespread irregularities. However, Councillor Digden isn't willing to give this up and has made it one of his key issues as the new year begins. 
Let's hear some discussion on the issue from the most recent Richmond regular council meeting, which took place just before Christmas. For the most part, this piece of footage is unedited, although we have cleaned up a couple of cases where there were technical issues on the Zoom call. Either way, we think that you'll appreciate being able to hear the discussion about whether local properties are being taxed. So let's take you to that Richmond Council meeting right now. It just seems like it's kind of fallen by the wayside. I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't. We haven't gotten much in return on the um, since the last meeting. Um, with they're not with the numbers that they provided. However, uh, I can honestly say that I found many more. Uh, I guess properties of large value, um, some including houses that are not being taxed or that no taxes are being paid on the property. So um, again, I don't know where we go from here, except, you know, I'm a firm believer that every piece of property, and I believe if I'm not, according to our MGA, every piece of land in the, in your county is supposed to be taxed and taxes being paid on them. Um, and we definitely have very many that aren't. So I, I think, I think one of the things we really have to push in uh, in 2022 moving forward is, I don't know if it's our CAO to have our taxation officer go, you know, section per section, uh, so many per day, really at the, at, you're not going to get them all done in, in a week, in a month, in a, probably a year, but honestly, in all fairness to all residents that pay taxes in the county of Richmond, it only seems fair that we look at these properties and we either uh, figure out who owns them, put them up for sale, or have uh, whatever is required. But again, we have many acres of property, some off lakes, some off rivers, some off oceans, some with houses, some that are vacant, some that are non-vacant and not paying taxes. So Councillor Digden, I mean, we certainly don't want to be repeating any work that's already been done. Um, my understanding was that PDSC had kind of wrapped that project. Maybe what we, you know, when they came and they presented at council, but it was very much a summary overview. Um, maybe there's a more detailed report that we could get from them. Is that what you're thinking? Is well, I'm hoping considering the numbers that they provided us at council, we're, uh, we're short about 400 to 500 uh, on their, I guess, you know, I can't think they had a number of 1500. There was so many that were 90 or 100 were chair or 190 were being bill taxes. The other couple hundred we're not, and then there was almost 400 unaccounted for. So again, those 400 unaccounted for have to fall into some category. And you know, as as councillors, we can't allow the next door neighbors of properties to, you know, not be paying taxes on on their piece of land. Yeah. So, um, so do councillors have questions for Councillor Digden on this? Or comments you wanted to make? I guess my question is like. So, so do you think that after they've done this work now, you're suggesting that we get our revenue manager to, to do the work again? Well, I'm, can, I'm just, I guess, um, I guess the short answer would be either be yes. If we, if all the land is unaccounted for, um, then our revenue manager has to be responsible to uh, provide PBSC. So PBSC doesn't, doesn't apply doesn't initially uh, do this. It's actually internal, and then we send it off to PVSE to continue to move it forward. Uh, PVSE doesn't, you know, all lands are have PID numbers, and all PID numbers should be associated with uh, with a, an assessment number, uh, an account number, but uh, they're all not linked that way. So I think we have to have our revenue manager look in and find out, you know, get get the plots from PVSE to find out what is taken care of, and then. Uh, whichever ones are not taken care of, then we have to move forward. And okay. I can, um, I can tell you honestly, deputy ward, a um, hundred acre piece of property in your area, as well as a 23 acre piece of property in your area with a house on it with um, that is uh, uh, being lived in right now. Uh, there are no taxes being paid on it. There's no assessment account number showing up. With no assessment. And on it. Yeah. So there's some. It's, again, I'm I'm not super prepared to have this conversation because I didn't realize that this was where this was heading. I guess right, but I I seem to recall that there was some rationale for some of those. Don, do you recall what those? Or does anybody? But yeah. I'll say specifically, Don, because that's his wheelhouse. He did that for so many years, right? Is there's 
I just, I, my memory is foggy, but I recall that there was some type of explanation in terms of why it could appear that way, but not actually be that way. Well, in a lot of cases, uh, even though you go on property online, it doesn't say that they're being assessed. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a tax bill associated with that property. In a lot of cases, when the revenue manager, uh, you know, investigates a property, maybe from a person, uh, from a person or a member from the public inquiring, and then if we get the right information, we can forward it off to PBSC. But we never ever make that determination as uh, as municipal staff. That's not a responsibility. However, if there are properties that need to be investigated, we can always provide them to PVSC. If there are other things that we need to do with respect to uh, determining title, then we can forward that off to the lawyer. Uh, revenue manager now and, and myself in the past did not have the expertise to do paralegal work to try and determine if the property was owned by a particular person. So that would be forwarded off to, you know, we forward it off to our lawyer for, for a title search. Now, I mean, if we want to sit there and start trying to... Uh, uh, straighten out properties that have a uh, strange title or no title at all, then, I mean, you know, get ready to pay, uh, pay a dear price because we're looking at between four and $700 per title search just to determine who the owner is. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the assessed owner either. And I think that mm. PVSC made that rather clear that, uh, you know, it's, it, there are some that they haven't uh, provided any, any information on and they may be complicated. And sometimes the complications uh, outweigh the benefits and uh, that may very well be the case in a lot of those properties um, if there is one particular property that the, that the, the councillor is discussing with respect to 23 acres and uh, we have no uh, we have no way of telling uh, you know that it's not assessed we could refer to PDSC but uh, the exercise that that they did um, it's always going to reveal problems and issues and, and uh, it's not something that's uncommon for all rural municipalities in the province. Yes, in, in reply to that, or just in personal reply to that, and, and yeah, we're not going to draw it out tonight, but I just wanted to bring it back to everybody's attention. PVSE, when they responded to us, there were 13 that have been identified as, uh, I guess, without an assessment, 562 were crown land, 280 needed, um, and were actually needs needed PID numbers or needed assessment, um, which which come to 842, which, which there was approximately 458 that were missing that hadn't even hit the radar. So again, we have over we have over 500 pieces of land in the county of Richmond that are unaccounted for or untaxed. It's, it's, that's unrealistic. So, I mean, coming from where I'm sitting, you know, we pay PBSE to do a certain job. If this isn't part of their job, then we have to figure out whose it is and we have to, uh, you know, four hundred dollars to seven hundred dollars may be a large price to pay for a piece of uh, property, but at the end of the day, if that property gets um, gets sold, whether it be at a tax sale or the taxes get collected, again, it's an investment long term, not short term. Well, if there is no assessment, if there is no assessment, and there is no tax bill, and there is no tax bill, there's no uh, opportunity to sell it at a tax sale. There are no correct, rares. but there is the opportunity to move forward to create the assessment to create a tax bill and then to forward it off to the owner. If the owner refuses to pay for that assessment, well then in a year or two years down the road, then we have the opportunity to sell that tax sale. Well, that all, it always depends on the amount of taxes that are associated with that property as well. And I know I know PVSC did indicate that there were a lot of properties that uh, were extremely complicated. That work that they did, I believe was, was, uh, was not their responsibility. However, it did cost them quite an amount of money to uh, to do the, the to to look at investigate the properties that they did. So since they've completed that report and we did receive kind of the summary, uh, like I am wondering, you know, if it would help be helpful to you, Councillor Digden, to kind of see a more detailed report because I look, like, I'm really not comfortable with asking staff to do work that's already been done. I think if there was something with more detail in it, and then if there's specific actions around groups of properties that you know the, of the 450 some, right? Then, then maybe then we can we will have something a little bit more concrete to discuss. Um, so, I so I agree, and I can continue. I, I can continue to provide, I guess, property of or PID numbers without assessment. Um, however, I didn't feel it was my job as a counselor to start. Usually, that's when I usually get told that that's not my job. So this time, I decided to, you know, take the forefront and say it's not my job. 
but I believe it's the job of the municipality or somebody who works there to work with uh, whether it be land registration. Again, we are talking about the county of Richmond, which, you know, we either work for or we are members of council. And therefore, you know, um, I know when I knocked on, on everybody's door, it was equality and fairness. And uh, if I'm paying my taxes and the guy next door isn't, well, then it's no longer equality and fairness. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, though, like as a next step, Councillor Digden, are you would you be okay with a motion to ask staff to inquire whether or not there's a more detailed report we could get sure. from them? Yeah, that would be great, actually. Okay, so I think I am I I'm hearing you make that motion then. <laughs> yeah, I okay. like to make the motion to provide to have staff uh, provide a more detailed report if possible. So the motion is to request that staff ask PBSC for a more detailed report. Right. Yeah. Okay. Can I have a second on that motion? Oh, thanks, Councillor Sean Sams. Um, any further discussion? The only thing I would add, if possible, um, when reaching out, since they have the maps, maybe, and I hate to say color coordinated, but you can do it for land sold. You should be able to do it for land that's unassessed. Is uh, maybe just send off a colored map of the properties that are unassessed. Say, yeah, I mean, if that's something that's if, available, if it's a, something that's available, yeah, okay, okay, further discussion, Question. okay. So, all those in favor, please say aye, 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 those opposed. Okay, that motion is carried. Earlier on this episode of Tell Hill 24-7, you heard me speaking to the Deputy Mayor of Port Hawkesbury, Jason O'Coin, about a couple of different issues. Well, at last week's regular monthly meeting of Port Hawkesbury Town Council, he also brought up ongoing concerns about the condition of the lighting for the Dan Willie McDonald Memorial Ball Field here in Port Hawkesbury. Let's hear what Deputy Mayor O'Coin had to say about why he wants to see the lights fixed as soon as possible. So I think for for at least a decade or more, um, people have been asking, I know Councillor McDougall has been asking for as long as I can remember to get new lights at the Dan Willie. And, you know, the conduits already all run there for the lights. And uh, myself as a, as a minor ball baseball coach you know I, I hosted provincials here this year and it was hard to do without the lights for the evenings you being a ball player and coach know the importance of having proper lighting and sometimes you know that lighting can be an issue in deciding a game or a tournament and I mean I'll share personal experience uh, in a past life uh, working for CIGO radio I was covering the 1997 provincial intermediate a championships on the labor day weekend in port hawksbury uh and the home team was tied five five going into extra innings and in the extra innings the darkness had come upon the field and the opposing team uh, from new brunswick uh, cracked what turned out to be a three-run homer that won the tournament for them because one of the players for port hawksbury did not have enough light to be able to see whether the ball was coming to him so uh that's the sort of thing where that's just one instance where uh, the difference between poor lighting and good professional lighting can actually decide a game and a tournament we just have so many opportunities and we have so many good volunteers in the area that want to put on bigger tournaments and we just can't because we we can't host them in the daylight hours that we have without the proper lighting so i have i have a very good feeling that uh, you know municipally provincially and federally we're all going to get together and we're going to find a way to make this happen as terry doyle said in our meeting that he has reached out to somebody and they're going to come take a look and give us an estimate of what we need and how much it's going to cost because none of us, none of, nobody here in Port Hawkesbury on council that I'm aware of is, is a professional at this. And we know we need lights, but we don't know what we need. And if I were to sit here today, Adam, and say we need 14 banks of lights and take you to the field and show you where they're at, I'd be wrong. Mm. So we're going to let the professionals come in and, and tell us what we need. And then we'll, we'll go forward trying to find the funding. It's not just about the baseball and, and the players. It's, it's about our community and, and what we can bring into the community. If we bring in eight teams for three days, in the area. That's a big boost to the local economy as well. And there you have it, folks. That wraps up this week's edition of Telil 24-7. Once again, I'd like to thank my interview guests for this week, Jason O'Coin, the Deputy Mayor of Port Hawkesbury, and John Bain, the Director of the Eastern District Planning Commission. And a big thank you to my Telil colleagues, Becky Borono and Nick Boudreau, for their work on formatting the Richmond Municipal Council footage that was used over the course of this episode. 
Of course, if you have any suggestions for future editions of Tell 24-7, or you'd just like to talk about what you've seen over the past hour, I'd love to hear from you, and you can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can also reach me by email. My address is adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your suggestions for future programs and your comments on the ones that we've already aired. You can reach the station in Arishat by phoning 902-226-1928. And as always, you can use the email address info at to send a message electronically. Don't forget to follow Talil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And our YouTube channel features every single edition of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as our sister programs Roundtable and Note Cote. And you can also find local analysis of Nova Scotia's COVID-19 media briefings on our Talil YouTube channel. They're available just a couple of hours after the briefings end, and we hope you find them useful. Once again, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you very soon with a brand new episode. Bye for now.